welcome friends and today is a very special session of the sustainable development e talk series which was co-hosted by cns and indian institute of management in indore this series was launched on world health day that is on 7th april 2020 and over a period of 2 months it has featured 30 online sessions for over 45 hours with more than 80 thought leaders from 15 countries globally who shared their deep insights on a range of issues related to sustainable development third year students of the integrated program of management that is ipm course uh, at im indore who had interned uh, uh, with the cns they actively participated in these talks but today they are on the other side of the fence and today and tomorrow these students will be the speakers and they will present their thoughts on sustainable development uh, 17 students will be our speakers for today and 19 will present tomorrow so a very warm welcome to all our speakers and also we are very honored to with to have with us two special guests mr ashok ram swarup and Ms. Firdaus Siddiqui. Uh, Firdaus is an educationist and has dedicated her life for providing quality education to the underprivileged. She is director of Rasville Academy and chief managing director of International Institute for Special Education. Ashok Ramsurup is a widely acclaimed, award-winning journalist from Durban, South Africa, and he has 42 years of rich experience in journalism. uh as much as i remember for 12 years he was with sunday times and 30 years in broadcast journalism as senior producer with south african broadcasting corporation sabc which i take to be the equivalent of bbc in south africa she was awarded the health justice award by south africa's gandhi development trust led by mahatma gandhi's granddaughter ila gandhi who has also featured in one of our talks so a very warm welcome to both of you now the first presentation today is by mihir thakur sunil jamuda and suraj patel they will share their insights on sustainable development goals and related challenges hello everyone and namaste good afternoon we hope that all of you are doing well the past few months have been quite rough for all of us and the planet so we sincerely hope that you and your families are safe and sound i am mihir I'm Suraj, and uh, I'm Sunil, and we shall be presenting on the topic sustainable development and related challenges. The Sustainable Development Goals (SDGs), also known as the Global Goals, were adopted by the All Indian Unite All United Nations Member States in 2015 as a universal call to. action to end poverty protect the planet and ensure that all people enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030 the 17 sdgs are integrated that is they recognize that action in one area will affect outcomes in others and that development must balance social economic and environmental sustainability background the sustainable development goals sdgs were born at the united nations conference on sustainable development in rio de janeiro in 2012 The objective was to produce a set of universal goals that meet the urgent environmental, political, and economic challenges facing our world. The SDGs replaced the MDGs, which were the Millennium Development Goals, which started as a global effort in 2000 to tackle the indignity of poverty. The MDGs established measurable, universally agreed objectives for tackling extreme poverty and hunger, preventing deadly diseases, and expanding primary education to all children, among other development priorities. now the millennium development goals the sdgs replaced the millennium development goals we started a global effort in 2000 to tackle the indignity of poverty the mdgs established measurable universally agreed objective for tackling extreme poverty and hunger preventing deadly diseases and expanding primary education to all children among other development priorities for 15 years the mdgs grow progress in the several important areas reducing the income poverty providing much needed access to water and sanitation driving down child mortality 
and drastically improving maternal health. They also kick-started a global movement for, pre for free primary education, inspiring the countries to invest in their future generation. Most significantly, the MDGs made huge strides in combating HIV AIDS and other treatable diseases such as malaria and tuberculosis. Some key achievements of MDGs are that since the year 1990, more than 1 billion people have been lifted out of extreme poverty. Child mortality rate has dropped by more than half. The number of out-of-school children has dropped by more than half. And since the year 2000, HIV AIDS infections have fallen by almost 40%. The legacy and achievements of the MDGs provide us with valuable lessons and experience to begin work on the new goals. But for millions of people around the world, the job remains unfinished. We need to go to the last mile on ending hunger, achieving full gender equality, improving health services and getting every child into school beyond primary. The SDGs are also an urgent call to shift the world onto a more sustainable path. The SDGs are unique in that they cover issues that affect all of us. They reaffirm our international commitment to end poverty permanently everywhere. They are ambitious in making sure no one is left behind. More importantly, they involve us all to build a more sustainable, safer, more prosperous planet for all humanity. And these are the 17 sustainable development goals. The first are no poverty, zero hunger, good health and well-being, quality education, gender equality, clean water and sanitation, affordable and clean energy, decent work and economic growth, industry innovation and infrastructure, reduced inequalities, sustainable cities and communities, responsible consumption and production, climate action, life below water, life on land, peace, justice and strong institution, and the last one, partnerships for the goals. Some major challenges that lie ahead of us are, first one, changing demographics. The population on the African continent is set to be doubled by the year 2050. Even compared with recent histories of rapid population growth in China and India, experts say that this is unprecedented and we need to ponder upon how will the society deal with this increasing population. With a growing population, we need to allocate more resources, resulting in depletion of the same available to the future generations. The next challenge that we face is of migration. If we are not able to absorb the young population, say in Africa, the result will be tension and migration. It is crucial to understand that migration is not just a temporary phenomena, but an increase in population that will increase until at least 2050. This will not end because we slightly adjust controls at the border. Migration at, mass, at a mass level results in an unprepared response to growing demands of resources like food, water and shelter. With the little resources available to Africa, one can understand that migration can become a grave challenge in the future. The recent refugee crisis in Europe is an example of how humanitarian crises are a global issue touching the lives of millions of people. The real challenge of achieving sustainable development goals is the time frame to achieve the targets by 2030. There are so many schemes and programs of the union government and state governments in India which are yet to be linked with the goals and targets of sustainable development goals. Earlier, the schemes of union, earlier the schemes of union and state governments are linked with SDGs, better the results. In India, Niti Aayog has already taken measures to link all central schemes for better implementation and achieving the targets of sustainable goals by 2030. Some state governments are yet to even start the process of linking uh, state schemes with goals due to lack of capacity building and non-seriousness to link them with the goals and achieve these targets. Next one is statistics and data. The important challenge is statistics. As statistics plays an important role to achieve the goals with target, there are so many indicators which determine where the goals stand for and what steps should be taken to achieve targets of the prescribed goals. Further, there are so many indicators which have no statistics which result in the weakness of the targets to implement and will not be able to achieve the goals well in the time frame year 2030. These indicators and statistics ultimately dictate the policies laid down by the government and help in keeping a tab on their progress so one can understand how crucial they are. Next challenge that we face is the slower and unequal economic growth. Not only are many emerging markets facing a downturn, 
but the commodity driven surge that many countries experienced in recent dec- decades has not brought about stable development as a consequence these so- societies tend to be extremely polarized and average citizens witness how things could get better but they wait wait and wait and never actually get the benefits it is not just the slowdown it is the model of growth that has been prevalent in a number of developing and underdeveloped countries vulnerable middle class the vulnerable middle class people who have improved their position who have joined the so called middle classes remain vulnerable there is a risk that they will fall back into the extreme poverty how do you address this it is not about the extreme poverty it is about social protection system and other policies resources hardly ever trickle down to the lowest strata of the society leaving them vulnerable and devoid of prosperity the next challenge the more contemporary uh, the, the one which developed more contemporarily is the global pandemic the recent coronavirus pandemic has put almost all activities in the world on hold for about 3 months now this means that we lose out on the progress we would have otherwise made in the, on the sdgs in these 3 months along with that we are witnessing a huge pressure on the healthcare industry which will push us back on sdg number 3 which states that everyone should have good health and well being with only limited economic activities being carried out in the near future we could have to work sensibly and smartly to ensure that we achieve these sdgs on time we would like to conclude by saying that there are many challenges that lie ahead of us but there are various schemes and papers only and the reality is different on ground level due to the dishonesty corruption lack of knowledge of the schemes and program implementation it should be mass movement for all citizens establishments and governments to be honest accountable and free from any type of correction f- corruption for implementation of sustainable development goals if the world work together to bring this about this positive change in the society we would surely succeed thank you thank you meher sonil and suraj very well presented indeed and uh, we now move on to our next presentation which is by anjali sonil B. Sai Sushma, Parv Juliana, Pranav Raghuraman, Priya Sahu, and Sri Shanta Reddy, and they will be talking on artificial intelligence and machine learning in the field of medicine. Technology has been attaining a negative connotation for the most recent times. The cost of technology can be seen in the increasing rates of deforestation, the rise of global warming. and the absolute carelessness in which we treat nature the increase in awareness has led to people becoming more environmentally conscious yet understandably we cannot compromise the development of countries as technology keeps advancing also we cannot use any more degradation to the environment for the advancement of technology or development however in light of recent events it is perhaps the technology that will help us emerge from the pandemic and skid on a more considerable extent this topic of ours we aim to see how technology can be more of a boon than a bane and how it can help doctors and essential workers and patients alike let me detail to you a few major benefits of why technology in medicine should be encouraged the emerging of artificial intelligence in the field of medicine and building of medical technology shows great potential in increasing efficiency precision and cutting costs one of the most important benefits is that medical technologies help in ensuring early and accurate diagnosis which is the most crucial stage towards a treatment early and accurate diagnosis helps in speeding up the recovery by higher rates as it also helps healthcare professionals like doctors and nurses to make more stable clinical decisions Washington Post reported in 2017 that research showed that up to 1% of patient deaths are attributed to errors in this stage. However, technology can also be used for non-communicable diseases when it comes to pinpointing accurate diagnosis. Another benefit is that technology lessens human to human interaction especially in this context. of the current pandemic this helps in keeping contagious diseases in check and also in keeping healthcare professionals like doctors and nurses safe from risk as well while 
patients generally don't keep track of their interaction with doctors the software does and since any minute detail reported by the patient can cause a massive shift in the diagnosis this development is very valuable one more major benefit is that the amount of time technology can save which can be a matter of life or death with many patients for example better india reported that nearly 70% of cancer deaths are caused due to late diagnosis and this can be significantly avoided in a country especially that of india we are very behind in the doctor to patient ratio and this necessitates such a feature these are some of the few major benefits of why technological advances are so important in the current context over to the next person in the sustainable development etoc series hosted by indian institute of management and dor and cns professor dr rishi sethi a noted cardiologist and biomedical researcher and amit khare the co-founder and ceo of evolve systems shared their insights on how artificial intelligence and machine learning solutions can address the challenge of healthcare around the world These technologies might be a ray of hope that might leave us better equipped to deal with such situations such as these unlike our predecessors who lacked the same when they dealt with such a crisis health professionals health professionals who have yet to embrace the resources available are likely to understand the their enormous potential and making the improvements and adjustments needed for simplifying operations lowering costs enhancing efficiency and above all improving the standard of treatment the idea behind this is the need to reduce human interaction especially in the current scenario to diagnose and treat people this ensures that doctors are relied upon only when necessary times of emergency and also reduces the risk of contracting the illness due to exposure in a hospital hence reducing the spread to a significant extent even in the case of surgeries robotic aid is often used to minimize human error i would like to quote this we can have robotic surgeries where the operator and the team sit outside the ot and perform the procedure with the help of console thereby again limiting the entire team being exposed to the patient on the table this was said by professor rishi in his talk which nonetheless implies the same hello uh, let's take a little detour from what priya has been talking about in past few minutes while the whole country is fighting against the covid-19 crisis the ones in the front line the doctors and the healthcare workers are working excruciatingly hard for the welfare of the patients and to minimize the damage exacted on society by the pandemic the lack of a definite cure at this stage makes their work extra challenging and there is also the added pressure of calming the nerves of patients and their families for there is a the doctors not only have to attend to patients in person but also have to stay connected to them over the phone and through video conferencing the threat of them catching the coronavirus and infecting their own families also looms large due to which most of the doctors have given up going to their home have shifted to solitary accommodations where they don't see their family for days on an end a disease as we all know is very contagious and managing it is a primary concern of the doctors this threat has loomed quite understandably so into the personal lives as well however at this time it is important to note that the doctors and healthcare workers have been infected uh, with the virus while treating their own patients they have to constantly wear pro- personal protective equipment for their own protection which is really the best case scenario for a lot of doctors in our country as most of them don't have access to even such basic kits and even amidst this psychological and operational upheaval that doctors have to go through there is a looming threat of violence against the healthcare workers by uh, the aggrieved family members of some of the patients several doctors have commented to new news reporting agencies that they recognize pressure and fear in present in society and still want to serve the nation and make all the possible efforts to ensure the number of fatalities in the nation are minimized during the SDG talks conducted on 1st May 2020 Mr Amit Khare 
give us deeper insights into the problems faced by India and its medical community in dealing with the pandemic. He says that the doctors to patient ratio is a major point of concern for a country like India. The WHO recommends a proportion of 900 patients or below for one doctor. But in India, the proportion is approximately 1700 patients to one doctor. And the ratio would not go down anytime soon as the nation cannot drastically increase, which is practically doubling in the case of India uh, within the short duration of this pandemic. Many of the diseases require specialists who are even rarer. This problem, the belief, can only be helped with the help of technology. It is a result of the interplay of all these problems that made a technology oriented solution necessary. As a consequence, um, Mr. Amit Khare came up with the idea which employs data based decision making and asynchronous communication to save the vital time of both doctors and patients by an impressive 30%. In this case, technology is clearly a stepping stone to improving accessibility to quality healthcare and helping reduce the social and economic devastation caused by the nature of the virus. This is another instance where the technological growth has accelerated during the times of a crisis. We can only hope that goods continue to see the positive effects percolate to, to the most needy and vulnerable sections of our society. We will now see what the technology is actually trying to accomplish. So one good example of how technology is being employed in the medical medical industry is the robotic triad system. So what exactly is the robotic triad system? Robotic triad system refers to a software that profiles a patient before the per- patient comes to visit the doctor by asking them about the relevant symptoms, the demographic data of the patient, as well as other details about regarding past diseases, etc. This information is then segregated by the software and is, sub- and is given to the doctor. This not only simplifies the amount of time that's taken by the doctor to diagnose the patient, but also makes the system more efficient. Once the doctor has prescribed a form of medication for the patient or a treatment, the software then keeps track of the patient to measure how efficient or effective this treatment is for that particular patient. Hence, this, 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 this robotic triad system creates a complete profile of the patient, making sure that the patient is, uh, is being effectively treated monitored and the disease is kept under control and cured. An example of the robotic triad system could be as follow. Suppose a patient is suffering from chest pain and now before he, the, he is referred to the doctor, he is asked to answer a set of questions that the software has provided. The software will ask a set of questions that the doctors generally ask when a patient comes and says that he or she is suffering from chest pain. Now, what is this question? For example, the one of the main questions that's asked is, from where is this chest pain coming? So, if the per- patient says it's coming from my left shoulder, the, the software then proceeds to ask questions that's relevant to his answer. Now, what, what is that? He can ask whether he or she is able to lift his left or right hand, uh, shoulder up. This would mean if the answer to that question is yes, then that would mean that the problem is not with the shoulder, but it could be something that's heart related. This way, the software helps to accurately narrow down the cause of the disease. And this data is then transferred to the doctor. Now the doctor would be able to uh, predict or rather understand the person's uh, disease or problem in a faster and more efficient way, such saving time, which then the doctor can use to see more patients. As you know, India has a very poor doctor to patient ratio. Apart from this, one key takeaway of this of this software is the fact that you can un- uh, the software can predict whether the disease is communicable or non-communicable in nature. If the disease is non-communicable in nature, then the doctor will know what kind of precautions that need to be taken by- before this patient comes to visit him in person. This way, it can also sp- the this way the doctor can limit his exposure as well as the exposure of all the other patients who are coming to visit him to a communicable disease. Thus, not only making the entire process 
more streamlined but also more efficient and safe for both the doctor and the patients the covid-19 pandemic exemplifies some of the most urgent health issues and the reaction of the industry will strengthen the way things move on researchers and experts from all fields collaborate to address the enduring complexities of healthcare data by paving the way for artificial intelligence to play a more significant role in medical science in these trying times of the pandemic the unexplored advances of machine learning and artificial intelligence may be the difference how we as a society emerge from the pandemic not only will this allow for a more efficient diagnosis and treatment of individuals it will also be a great boon to essential workers who are sacrificing themselves on a day to day basis to serve us better oh thank you very much very well presented simply awesome thanks uh, anjali b sai sushma parv pranav priya and shri shanta reddy very well done uh, we now invite divyansh prakash and abhay singh to present on education and its purpose and welcome for those we had welcomed you but perhaps you were not there so ah, we were sorry welcome. i mean there were some technical glitches that, that that's in, fine uh, so divyansh, good afternoon everyone thank you for the invitation divyansh and abhay okay Good afternoon to everyone. I would like to begin by mentioning about the SDG talk by Dr. Sandeep Pandey, which happened on June 4, 2020, where he covered the topic of inclusive and equitable education quality for all, which is the fourth SDG laid out by the United Nations. I really liked his point of views on the topic, and the question which he asked in the end of the presentation was quite thought-provoking and compelled me to research deep further on the topic. He asked us the question. what is the purpose of education i believe it is the most fundamental but extremely necessary question as it will decide the way in which we will be moving forward to achieve all our sustainable development goals therefore i'll utilize my time in talking about this issue and while researching for it uh, i found out that this question isn't new this has been asked for a long while and martin luther king said that the function of education is to teach one to think intensively and think critically but education which stops with the efficiency may prove the greatest means to the society the most dangerous criminal may be the man gifted with reason but no morals we must remember that intelligence is not enough intelligence plus character is the goal of true education i believe the keywords here to be taken out from this quote is think critically and moral We at IIM Indore are at a place of privilege because we have courses like critical thinking and ethics in our program, and might not value it as much as we should be giving it. But there are a lot of out there who are devoid of this knowledge and of this basic skill, and end up not taking the best decision for themselves in the future. I believe we can easily achieve all of the said keywords in our curriculum if we have the political will for it. Being resident of Delhi, I can see the difference in the government schools of Delhi. their entrepreneurship mindset curriculum is a step forward towards achieving the real goals of education as said by martin luther king junior the, the uh, as you can see these are the things which the entrepreneurship mindset curriculum cover and the most interesting part of this curriculum what i found out was the segment where they are informed how to distinguish between what is an opinion and what is a fact which is very much necessary in the current time and the most important and fundamental thing that this curriculum has is a micro research project which is given to each and every student where uh, they need to interview 10 neighbors or relatives who are employed in different jobs or businesses and are asked to inquire about their struggles preparation and techniques to reach the same place as theirs it will help them to have an intuition about various fields and what they really like rather than anyone counseling them what is best for them because i feel it greatly undermines someone's capability or can give them completely wrong direction if someone else is imparting them what they should be doing rather than it coming from within which is intuition 
entrepreneurship mindset curriculum can not just be reduced to making students entrepreneurs and a lot of people have been saying that they can very well do jobs under a set system and be entrepreneurs which will be a positive addition to the skills of the workforce which is the dire need of the current time fortunately i am part of an organization in i am indore in which i got an opportunity to implement a small part of entrepreneurship mindset curriculum the emc in government schools of indore the sub district magistrate of mau the district under which i am indore is situated asked us to teach the government school students for the ipm ate exam which is the entrance examination for ipm course at i am indore we found this as an opportunity to implement the altered form of micro research which was there at emc for various fields in those schools so we took this uh, we so we took an indirect and long term approach towards it rather than just going to those schools and directly teaching them for the said examination so we broke it down into small targets to be implemented over the years we initially informed them about the opportunities that they have one of them being ipm of course then we counseled them towards the best possibilities according to their interests and skills and we gave them the choice of what they want to do then we had some basic tests given to them and the data so collected from those tests helped us identify who are actually interested in those in the course of ipm and thereafter we planned them to train for the examination and inform them about the scholarship which they can avail from the government which will make the education completely free and how some of the students at i am indore are the beneficiary of it we believed in the fact that rather than giving them tuition and directly telling them how to crack ipm 80 we give them an intuition of what they can actually achieve if they really want to learn about the ipm course or the ipm ate exam so therefore we uh, programmed some interactive sessions with the students of i am indore who were from different fields so emc actually acted as a precedence for our actions we took in those schools at uh, near indore and how different government and organization can also take the step forward by changing those pedagogies that they have been using for years by changing it to something like emc for a very small or a very brief period of time we all know that there are still some problems with the emc curriculum as most of the schools teachers and students consider it as a nice to have curriculum and not critical to solving pressing challenges that the society is facing right now it will take time to be absorbed by everyone because it was just launched in 2018 and government needs to generate commitment and sense of criticality to solving the challenges that emc is striving to address right now i won't say that we have achieved our goal with the help of emc but it is one of the most crucial step that we had to take forward for a better education system and the policy makers need to understand and adapt to it for the greater good of the education system for the entire country the question still remains is is quality education freely accessible to all i would like to state a statistics over here we all are seeing that education system of delhi is doing very good and everything is pretty fine the infrastructure is improving and everything but still the enrollment in the government schools of delhi government fell by 8% from 2012 to 2018 yeah and it was comparative increase, and it had comparative increase in the enrollment for private schools although the government school regulates the increase in school fees of the private schools in delhi but it still re- remains unaffordable by a large chunk of society so i would like to end my part by saying is quality education freely accessible to all good afternoon everyone i'm abhay i'm going to talk about the current education system we will then look at the common school system and how it could co- solve our current problems and then finally we'll take a look at the education system of singapore presently the indian public education system is neither adequately funded nor job oriented the vast majority of graduates do not have the required job skills this has led to a fledgling market for private education in a democracy it is essential that there is universal access to quality education and equal opportunity to every child at an affordable cost having unequal opportunities for education leads to an increase in the social segregation and to perpetuate and the widen the class distinctions education is the means for the weaker sections of the society to climb out of poverty and live a dignified and better life the privatization of education is a big hindrance to the universal accessibility of education to the masses
quality education is not accessible to the economically weaker sections of the society because of the privatization of education the children of the politicians and bureaucrats attend the private schools leading to a lack of political will to improve the quality of education provided by the government schools as a result the government schools are suffering and the quality of education is not rising to achieve the aim of universal access to education the plan of the common school system was introduced the kothari commission recommended long back to use the common school system of public education to bring the different social classes and groups together and promote the emergence of an egalitarian and integrated society in css no child can be denied admission by any school in the neighborhood irrespective of his or her social or economic background the common school system aims for an inviting learning environment competent teachers and a right student teacher ratio common school system has existed in various forms in other developed countries like the usa france other scandinavian countries etc it's a tried and tested form of public education system adopted by all the developed or developing country to teach the masses and india must adopt it to provide education to everyone the common school system is not a uniform schooling system but on the contrary it is involved intricately with the local community the schools have a certain degree of individuality and academic freedom the common government schools should have enough funding and oversight to fulfill their responsibilities of providing quality education to everyone no developed or developing country has achieved universal elementary education or universal secondary education without a robust common schooling system which is state funded and state regulated both india and singapore have similar attitudes to education but the singapore education system is regarded as one of the best in the world while india lags far behind current singapore education system was introduced about 4 decades ago in the 1970s and has resulted in one of the most advanced and skilled workforce in the world in the recent pisa test the singaporean students ranked second globally the neighborhood schools are publicly funded and are completely merit based the students there are divided into three levels depending on their ability in a process called streaming to increase the efficiency of education however the streaming process was leading to undue stress on the students and causing stratification in the society between the different levels of students after about four decades later the singapore plans to scrap its streaming process in 2024 after taking feedback from the students parents and educators to integrate its society better the singapore government listened to its most important stakeholders in education the students the, the parents and took appropriate action the indian government should borrow a leaf from the singapore government and change the education system depending on our present needs things that we in, could learn from them include investing heavily in education to increase the literacy levels and improve the infrastructure keeping the student teacher ratio low so that individual attention can be paid to the students around 10 to 15 and adapting to the changing times and take regular feedback from the most important stakeholders which are the students their parents and the educators thank you everyone for attending the session thank you very much divyansh and abhay very well presented and uh, very impressed with the innovate Uh, the innovative use of the blackboard in your presentation as your topic was about education also very inspiring example of emc shared by divyansh and hope other privileged people like you replicate this real life example which you shared and let us not forget that there is a difference between literacy and education and i strongly believe that education is all about learning unlearning and relearning and it is a lifelong process never ends we move on to our next presentation uh, we have anjali roy anurag ratan ankit kumar and kostub jain and they will share their thoughts on effects of covid 19 on micro small and medium enterprises or msmes as we call them hello everyone on behalf of my group I would like to welcome all of you to this special webinar where we have something very important to discuss. Before introducing and explaining the topic, I would like to thank CMS 
for giving us the stage to express our views in front of this intellectual audience. Special thanks to Shobha Ma'am and Bobby Sir for giving us this great opportunity. Thank you. The topic of our presentation is the effect of COVID-19 pandemic on micro, small and medium enterprises, that is MSME. It is a very distinct pleasure for me to work with my fellow group members on discussing the problems that businessmen we are facing and have been deeply impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown. The topic is very relevant when we talk about how small businesses got affected amidst COVID-19 and the lockdown. Small, indigenous businesses were already not doing good before the virus hit India. Other foreign-run companies were already on the top of the chain. With our Prime Minister urging us to become Atmanirbhar, it becomes way more essential for us to understand the plight of these local businesses in order to empathize with them. So, we will discuss more on this as we go further in the presentation. Thank you. Let me introduce you to the speakers for the presentation. Anjali Roy, Ankit Kumar, Kostav Jain and I, Anurag Ratan, are the students of I am Indore and we will lead you with the topic. The handicraft artisans of India are known for the perfection of craftsmanship, the excellence of design and form, and an unsurpassed sense of color. The craftsman's position in the predominantly agricultural society is pivotal, for it makes the village society self-contained. The sector provides employment to a vast segment of craft persons in the rural and semi-urban areas and generates substantial foreign exchange while preserving its cultural heritage. The sector suffers from being unorganized, additional constraints of lack of education, low capital, poor exposure to new technologies, absence of market intelligence, and a poor institutional framework. Small businessmen are depending on the middlemen for raw materials, finance, and the market for finished products because of their illiteracy, ignorance, and poverty. The success of handicrafts depends on how well the artisans can produce articles in keeping with the tastes and preferences of consumers. Other small businesses also suffer, suffer similar problems. With this being today's discussion, where we will discuss everything about what were the conditions of these micro, small and medium enterprises and how the lockdown has impacted them and what is the solution for the same, I request Anurag Ratan to lead the topic. Even before the pandemic, the MSME faced a large number of problems. First was the problem of raw material. These mainly occurred because of three reasons. First was the absolute scarcity of raw material, second was the poor quality and third was the high cost. The majority of small and medium enterprises mostly produce items dependent on local raw material. Since the emergence of modern small scale industries manufacturing a lot of sophisticated items, the problem of raw material has emerged as a serious problem in the production efforts. Even the micro and small enterprises that depend on local resources for raw materials faced similar kind of, kinds of problems. An example of this type is the handloom industry, which depended for its requirement of cotton on local traders. These traders often supplied their cotton to weavers on the condition that they would sell their ready clothes to these traders only. Then the traders sell cotton to them at a fairly high price. This is a clear example of how the poor weavers are subjected to double exploitation at the hands of traders. Keeping in view that the raw material problem of micro and small enterprises, the government does make some provision for making raw material available to these units. Nonetheless, micro and small enterprises with no special staff to conduct uh, and contact the official agencies are left with inadequate supplies of raw material. As a result, they have to resort to open market purchases at a very high price. This in turn increases their cost of production and thus puts them in an adverse situation in comparison to their large rivals. Second is the problem of finance. This is mainly due to two reasons. First, it is due to the scarcity of capital in the whole country or is due to the weak credit worthiness of micro and small enterprises in the country. Due to the weak economic space, MSME find it difficult to take financial assistance from commercial banks and financial institutions. As such, they are, opt they are bound to obtain credit from money lenders on a very high rate of interest. Third is the problem of marketing. These small units often do not possess any marketing strategy. 
In consequence, their products do not fare very well with the quality and quantity of the products of the large scale industry. Therefore, they suffer from competitive disadvantage in comparison to large scale units. But nowadays, this is slowly changing. As in order to protect micro and small enterprises from this competitive disadvantage, the government of India has reserved certain items for small scale sectors. Also, the Trade Fair Authority of India and the State Training Corporation help the small scale industries in organizing their sales. The National Small Industry Corporation is also helping small units in obtaining the government orders and, locate, and locating export markets. Fourth is the problem of underutilization of capacity. There are many studies that show that there is a gross underutilization of installed capacities in micro and small enterprises. It is estimated that on an average, they show that 20 to 30 percent of capacity is not utilized in micro and small enterprises. The very integral reason of this problem is the power problem faced by micro and small enterprises. In short, there are two aspects to this problem. One, supply is not available to the small units on the mere asking and if it is available, it is limited to only a few hours in a day. Second, unlike large scale industries, the micro and small enterprises cannot afford to go in for alternatives like installing their own thermal or solar units because these involve heavy costs. Since micro and small units are weak in economic front, they have to manage as best they, as they can with what they have. Aside from these, the MSMEs also face a number of other problems. These include technological obsolescence, inadequate and an irregular supply of raw materials, lack of organized market channels, imperfect knowledge of market conditions, unorganized nature of operations, inadequate availability of credit, faci credit facility, constraints of infrastructure facilities including power and deficient managerial and technical skills. There has been a, a lack of effort in coordination among the various support group of organizations set up over the period for the promotion and development of these industries. So, as far as the pre-corona period is concerned, quality consciousness has not been generated to the desired level despite various measures taken in this regard. Our next speaker is Anjali Roy, who will speak on the scenario of MSMEs during the lockdown imposed because of COVID-19 pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic left a huge void in all the sectors of Indian economy, but the worst hit sector was the medium, small and micro enterprises which is called as the MSMEs in short form. The major reason for the unfortunate situation of MSMEs was the lockdown imposed by the government, firstly in particular states, then in the whole country because of the increasing cases of COVID-19 patients in India. The disadvantages scenario can be evident by the fact that lakhs of migrant workers were left abandoned without jobs across the whole country as soon as the lockdown came into force. Thousands of these workers also worked in small-scale industries. These migrant workers had to go back to their native places in need for food and shelter. The workers were not the only ones to face the storm. The situation of the micro and small business owners was also similar. These owners struggled hard to pay their workers as well as feed their own family. As the economic activity stopped due to the lockdown, MSMEs grappled with problems like cash flow, low liquidity, lack of workforce and fractured distribution chain. Reports suggest that a loss of as much as 1.2 trillion rupees could have been incurred due to the pandemic. 99% of MSMEs fall in the micro category, out of which more than 50% are situated in the rural India, which include rural artisans, handicraft sellers, and so on. These micro businesses were left crippling due to the lockdown. Small, medium, and micro handloom industries also faced adverse situations. The total lockdown raised a question mark on the existence of many MSMEs because these are not the firms that have too much cash or money to wait out the crisis. The main reason for the loss incurred are halt in the production, 
disruption of the supply chain decline in demand transportation issues and lack of workforce it is difficult even in normal times for handicraft industries and the small scale artisans to survive because of their small business size small scale of operation limited financial and managerial resources and distribution system but with the lockdown life came to a halt there were no melas no wedding ceremonies no exhibitions no sales and even no money to feed the families of these small business owners and workers idols were not sold as the cultural festivals could not be celebrated publicly cloth industry was compromised artifacts such as diyas idols lights and candles which were used in temples and for celebrations were not sold eid was also celebrated during the lockdown in india and therefore the profit small scale industries could have made got minimalized because decorative items and other such things were not essentials and hence not sold vimal kumar a young rajasthani potter said in his interview with the hindu that all his orders had been cancelled even if he tried his best he would not be able to clear the stock for 2 years at least this will cause not only debt but also a decrease in production crafts people would be out of jobs for a long time he added many women who earn their daily wages through crafts and cloth making felt helpless and hopeless during lockdown some people were even saying they don't know who will be their doom the virus or their hunger msme segment has perhaps been the hardest hit due to the prolonged lockdown i would now like to invite our next speaker kostub jain who would speak about the situation of msmes post lockdown and suggestions for their development thank you anjali now the question is what one must do after lockdown or after the situation normalizes for the same unido united nations industrial development organization as well as ficci federation of indian chamber of commerce and industry have come up with various steps and guidelines for msme to kick start their recovery for efficient recovery of such industries government will also play an important role msmes are in dire need to jump back into business post the upliftment of nationwide lockdown in india which is happening in phases of unlock 1 unlock 2 and unlock 3 even after lockdown covid-19 will lurk around and create a high degree of uncertainty even after the lockdown markets remain tight and there are cash constraints for msmes the threat that can be faced are low business income piled up inventory high expense incurred on labor energy rent and other business resources the issue of low credit worthiness is a problem of msme sector which needs to be dealt with labor force is the biggest constraint as many migrant workers have returned to their home amidst the uncertainties outside the safety net of regular salaries or social security artisans are helpless but these crafts people are not going to sit and lament their losses they know that art is the purest way of cultural communication and they will enhance it craft is sadly not an essential it is the first thing to be struck off any consumer's wish list when purchasing power diminishes crafts people too will need to adapt to these changing times locked out of their li- livelihoods these people are in need of unusual solutions and the united efforts of the government craft organizations and designers to revive different crafts and communities will need different solutions disposing of existing inventory planning their reentry into what will be a very changed market skills have to be targeted to differing markets it can include making functional products of everyday use change is starting women used to make fine embroidery are turning to mask making ormal cement in baju 
made 5000 mask in the first two weeks rang sutra has distributed 26000 mask till now all these people need is a helping hand from the consumers and the government in order to stand on their feet again micro enterprises have the potential to spur job creation the revival of the msmes depends on solving problems such as financial condition demand for products and services availability of migrant workforce and exposure to the export market the government's package of rupees 3.7 lakh crore for the msmes can provide them liquidity rbi is trying to provide them with the help but it has had limited impact till now the things government can do to help msme are provide them tax relief loans liquidity and boost demand for msme products the government can guarantee them credit which will help them get loans by banks banks can extend loan tenures in order to help these people out for solving labor force related issues msme should start hiring temporary work in workers they should tie up with iti's they should follow safety measures during the pandemic and educate their workers about the precautionary measures as citizens of india we can do our bit by buying products made in india and not buy the products manufactured outside or assembled in india we should buy msme products which these people make in india and increase the demand of these products i would like to thank everyone who has helped to develop the sensitivities to understand the plight of the small scale indigenous businessmen of our country and at large the problems our economy has faced due to world pandemic covid-19 i would like to wind up our presentation by saying that we at the ground level can give a push to our economy towards the direction of a great development by making small conscious choices to choose indian products over foreign products and the examples we have taken to explain our understanding of the small scale indigenous products are not just limited to these industries but in fact hundreds of other industries have been affected by the pandemic and will go into major loss if we as indian citizens do not take the required steps and that too soon so please stay safe take the necessary precautions and go indian am i audible yeah Yes. 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 Okay. Uh, so, uh, first of all, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, what I am going to discuss today, uh, which are the SDG seventeen, seven and seventeen, with learnings from MDGs. Now, uh, SDGs to give you a bit of introduction, uh, uh, SDGs which were the sustain, which are the sustainable development goals, were adopted by UN in its General Assembly in two thousand fifteen. which was planned as a blueprint to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all these are to be achieved by 2030 and there are 17 in total including 169 targets these are measured by indicators and there are variety of quantitative tools to measure product progress of them they are highly interdependent on each other uh, as we'll see as as i progress with the presentation now um in in the recent times the scandinavian countries are at the top perhaps because of their low population and relatively high per capita gdp in achieving the sdgs one by one the global achievement of the goals is determined by sdg index uh, sdg index and dashboard a scale from 0 to 100 where 0 is the worst and 100 means the full compliance with the targets in this ranking sweden is at the high is at the first place with 84.5 with uh, denmark at second at 83.9 and no norway at third now uh, may, these are mainly due to their good performance in the socio economic issues although the data data still shows that they still work on the transition to a low carbon debt economy by contrast if you look at african countries like central african republic which is at the lowest of the list at 26.5 of the index liberia at 30.5 and the democratic republic of congo at 31.3 are in the queue they share lacks in all aspects but especially but not restricted to things like 
which are basics to basic to humanity like poverty uh, a, a basic health and hunger now um, to start off i would like to um, explain with the sdg 7 which is the seventh goal in the seven, list of 17 goals now as you can see from the infographic uh, it the sdg 7 aims to ensure access to affordable reliable sustainable and modern energy for all now globally 12.6 percent still lack access to modern electricity and by access is just the means that the hardware is present in their in their vicinity it doesn't mean that actually the electricity is reaching so there are still 12.6 percent people where there is no even the hardware structures of electricity now energy accounts for roughly two third of the global greenhouse gas emissions so it becomes a really important goal now in india uh, as stated by uh, government data nearly 85 percent people do have the access to electricity and there are claims that nearly 100 percent of the villages have been electrified in terms of the uh, uh, in terms of the transformer grids in each and every village but still on ground reality shows that 31 million houses still lack access to electricity mm -hmm. now there have been ambitious renewable targets set uh, to be achieved by 2022 these include 175 gigawatt generation by renewable sources like uh, from solar 100 gigawatts and f uh, led by wind wind biogas and hydropower now in addition to the the core contributions of sdg7 and even SDG 13, which require the modern energy, modern energy for all, and an urgent action to combat climate change, the renewable energy sector can also make critical contributions to the other 15 SDGs, including helping to alleviate poverty, fight hunger, increase health, increase access to healthcare, education, and clean water. There. Uh, and not only these, they can also help protect life in land and in water. India. So in India, specifically regarding the goal SDG 7, it is projected to be a significant contributor in the, to the rise in global energy demand, around one quarter of the total. However, as of 2016, more than 207 million people in India uh, uh, were not, didn't have access to electricity, which re which reduced 31, as I explained in the infographic, by 2018. Now, the ta uh, the, uh, these, the, the majority of these initiatives, which resulted in such a huge uh, difference, were due to the National Solar Mission, which is playing an important role in the work towards renewable energy in India, as India has an abundance of social uh, so abundance of solar energy. Now. To lay out the five most important targets for goal seven, uh, these include ensuring universal access to affordable, reliable, and modern energy services, substantial, subst increase substantially the share of renewable energy, doubling the rate of improvement in energy efficiency, and also enhancing international cooperation to facilitate access to clean energy. Also, last but not the least, it is to expand the infrastructure and upgrade technology for supplying modern and sustainable energy services for all in any country they may be. Now, as you can see, uh, as you can see from the uh, map, uh, the present scenario for SDG 7 looks like this. So there are hardly a, hand, uh, a handful of countries which have achieved affordable and clean energy as of 2018 and 2019. So you can see Canada, Brazil, and some Scandinavian countries like Norway, Sweden, and Finland who have achieved and uh, who have this specific SDG achieved. But the the majority uh, the majority of some continents like Africa have still not have still have major challenges in remaining in this particular goal. India also does unfortunately come under this list, and so does Australia. Now. Uh, moving on to SDG 17, as you can see from the infographic, uh, globally, the $153 billion was the official development assistance in 2018, higher, which was the highest ever recorded. SDG 7 aims to strengthen the means of implementation and revitalizing the global partnership for sustainable development. This means that basically there needs to be a strong global partnership for the goals, the other 16. 
Now in India, five hundred and twenty one point two billion US dollars was India's external debt in December. Now uh, there is a stark contrast if we look at the BRICS countries, uh, which form forty two percent of the world's population but contribute just to global GDP, which means that there is some some leverage into other countries which has still not been able to partner all together. Now, for, in India, for every hundred people, approximately forty-two percent have access to internet. Now, uh, uh, more than seventy-five percent of the urban population are inter internet subscribers, but as little as under fifteen percent of this remains in the rural areas, which needs to be increased. Now, it is quite quite essential to revitalize the global partnership for sustainable development. This underlies from the UN explanation. A success, UN, as UN says, and I quote: "A successful sustainable development agenda requires partnerships between government, the private sector, and the civil society. These inclusive partnerships, built upon principles and values, a shared vision, and shared goals that place people and the planet at the center, are needed at the global, regional, national, and most importantly, at the local level." Now the UN has defined 19 targets and 25 indicators for the SDG 17. Here I would like to uh, uh, give my personal opinion, which is quite an unpopular one, because particularly and even by UN guidelines, there is supposed to be no hierarchy in achieving SDGs as individually they are not considered more important than the other. But And uh, um, I think it is imperative not only according to the data but also to sentiments which are really important in a world in and a geopolitical scenario which has been which has been made really small due to the uh, globe due to globalization and the advent of internet. Now, hu uh, humans have an, have had an incredible track record of bettering the future for our upcoming generations. For example, in the 1890s. the average person lived off on less than 1 dollar a day in today's money mm. that al that alone can uh, that alone can be a measure of how long away we have come and hence for should strive for even more in the 21st century which should be the century of sustainable development as of 2019 progress on some means of implementation targets is moving rapidly permanent personal remittances are at an all time high an increasing proportion of the global population has access to internet and technology yet significant challenges remain private investment flows are not well in, in line with the sustainable development which is a major issue now as you can just yeah so as you can see uh, the present scenario regarding the sdg 17 there are ma majority of the countries have a major challenges or significant challenges remaining including developed countries like us canada and e even australia now uh, uh, only a, only like only a, only 3 to 4 countries have actually achieved this sdgs which include namibia which was it is kind of an unprecedented country to be make that list now moving up, moving on to the uh, mdgs so the sdgs were highly inspired by the mdgs so what were the mdgs really in september 2000 the at the un millennium summit the un general assembly adopted the declaration uh, united nations millennium declaration now the, uh, the, the which called for a global partnership to reduce extreme poverty was the first ever global strategy with quantifiable targets to be agreed upon all the UN, un member states and world's leading development institutions now as you can see they they are they were eight in total and were upon a period of 15 years till 2015 to be achieved they range from ext eradicating extreme poverty and hunger to all the way to developing a global partnership for development now a, a major thing which you can uh, observe from these are they are quite similar to some of the sdgs uh to uh, so what actually makes the sdgs different here is the fact that in sharp contrast to the mdgs the sdgs are uniformly applicable to all countries of the world removing the developed versus developing dichotomy 
that had left MDGs open to criticism in its original draft. And while there are similarities, as I mentioned before, because for example, they have they have been done over a 15 year period, as are the SDGs being developed till 2030. But the SDGs have significantly expanded on the scale and content of the MDGs from eight goals to 17 and to a whopping 169 targets. Now the SDGs are focused on global development with with and for sustainability and demonstrate an understanding that the environment is not an add on or in opposition to sustainable development, but rather the base that underpins all other goals as a result. Now, whereas the MDGs uh, maintained a retrospectively narrow focus on poverty reduction, the SDGs include new themes which reflect an approach that sees the environment, economy and society as embedded systems rather than separate competing pillars against each other. Another significant difference which could be observed is that how they have been creating. The crafting of SDGs has been regarded as an unparalleled participatory policy process and this is reflected in the scale as mentioned. A UN open working groups, a working group OWG made up of 70 countries sharing 30 seats was established in 2013 to draft the SDGs. Now these uh, have been able to provide significant input into the up content as well as have sub local and subnational governments. Lastly, uh, with global uh, with global urbanization forecast is to continue throughout the course of 2030 agenda for sustainable development. We will likely in, uh, we will likely hope to see persistence of challenges to the SDGs such as uh, planning development resource de management, demographics, and services. Now, the strategic long-term planning perspective would focus on interlinkages with, within regions, partly because progress on SDGs will not be made if a country is only considered as a separate unit or if a district or city is considered in isolation. Now, moving on to the, S uh, the issues which are primarily and secondarily faced by the SDGs. First of all, I would uh, like to focus on the pre-corona era. So one of the most important issues which came up were, was that of systematic issues. Now, these are dynamic issues in nature. So for example, the bilateral development partners respect for country policies declined for 64% in six, 2016 to 57% in 2018. Some 76% of new development projects and programs aligned their objectives to those defined in the country strategies and or plans in 2018. However, only around half of result indicators, that is 52% for these interventions were drawn from country owned result frameworks and only 44% of result indicators were monitored using data and statistics from government monitoring system, which raises the questions again on the data monitoring as well as the integration potential. Now, in 2018, 51 of 114 countries reported overall progress towards the strengthening the multi-stakeholder part uh, partnerships and the means of implementation. There was a need to increase the space for civil society's contribution. Similarly, issues such as missing out on integration potential, data and monitoring challenges, financing and ampling, including the North-South divide, which require the financing to be close to approximately $17 trillion in order to achieving the SDGs by 2030. Now, an important four-way to making MDGs, SDGs successful could be learned from MDGs. So uh, the Millennium Development Goals provide a bench, can be treated as a benchmark for the progress. Another key to making SDGs a success will be making sure the cross-cutting issues of sustainable production and consumptions are a priority. This can be accomplished by moving towards economic models that are at once sustainable and inclusive. Cities which are at the central hubs of both innovation and global economy are where the transition to such sustainable economic models will continue to occur. However, these just not include the mega cities like New York or New Delhi. Small and medium sized cities also do compromise the statistical majority of urban areas and are experiencing rapid growth rates. Now, coming to the present scenario of COVID-19 and the post-COVID era. 
as we know that this has been a, a pandemic which a pandemic which has struck us struck humanity nearly after 100 years of last of such kind especially the problem in sdg 17 as the pandemic affects not only the sdg 3 which it does in the most which is the good health and well being for the humanity but also the economic aspects which invariably affects all sdgs as global economy is expected to shrink at least 5% in 2020 which is the largest contraction in economic activity since the great depression and it is far far worse than the 2008 9 global financial crisis since as i have discussed above regarding my opinion of the sdg 17's importance one of the aspect which is rather less covered along the lines and mostly left under the mechanics and tactics is that of trust building for the partnership i believe trust lies the ba- at the basis of every partnership especially in geopolitical scenario that is between countries for a truly sustainable world here due to the pandemic which is almost uh, as i said 100 years after such kind which happened last as spanish flu in 1920 when to uh, to give an example to put things into perspective two largest immigrants who uh, undoubtedly did bring the largest wave of flu into us were identified as southern italians and eastern europeans now they were prejudiced highly against at that time due to them due to them being so called being the carriers of death now in the present case in the case of covid and china now the china has uh, developed itself to be a uh, a contender contender for superpower and a very good contender to usa but after the covid situation the effect in prejudice and rather segmentation of chinese people is and will only grow in its prominence whose effect has been maximized by the ongoing geopolitical scenario which is incredibly hostile against china and its reasons definitely have substance to it then again in view of india the recent border dispute of aksai chin in eastern ladakh where unfortunately 20 of indian soldiers were martyred along with ever growing dispute in the south china sea among many more border disputes which china has among with the other countries this is leading to a very difficult position for a contender future contender of superpower and a competitor to us which is china now it has put itself and is not making efforts which are substantial to compensate them this partnership expected for the sdg 17 and worldwide affecting other 16 goals as well where now most of the world has grown and is growing more hostile towards them as the days pass by will make it a challenge not only for un but also other countries which have been in a bilateral partnership with china the recommendation from un to countries as a bottom line is to ward off worst effects of covid-19 countries should prioritize action in three areas primarily now one of them is protecting progress already made towards the sdgs so as not to backtrack second is accelerating the universal provision of quality basic services and lastly maintaining the environmental gains of this period to reverse trends in degradation of nature i would like to thank uh, pobi sir and uh, shobha ma'am for giving me the continuous support and this is pretty much it from my end if there are any questions i would be happy to answer them thank you very much sardaj for a very informative presentation and uh, sorry i was off the air because my internet had gone off and still i am on a very weak internet connection so i am not switching on my video and i hope i am able to take forward the rest of the uh, presentations i also thank anjali anurag ankit and kosthu for sharing uh, focusing on the plight of micro enterprises that are in the unorganized sector and largely employ the disadvantaged and promoting social enterprises could be one solution there at least part of the solution and now last but not the least we have jeevan joseph who will be presenting on feminism and sustainability in the digital age over to hello you hello friend uh, thank you ma'am hello friends uh, so as ma'am said my topic today will be feminism in the digital age so it addresses the sdg number 5 which is nothing else other than gender equality uh, so i'll just run you through the highlights of uh, a video presentation that will follow uh, this and uh, basically the video it 
uh, defines feminism uh, in a very minimally uh, defines fem feminism and its goals and also uh, gives key insights about the uh, early history of feminism and then it moves on to the key issues that feminism uh, today faces which is gender stereotypes workplace harassment inclusion of women of all races at the gender pay gap etc we'll have statistics and uh, research cutouts uh, pasted along the way so that you get more context of uh, the entire uh, movement and uh, then we'll move on to the central theme that is digital era and feminism we will follow an mie format where a measure is mentioned and then the impact of that measure and an example for example there is a uh, feminist blogs how they impact the feminist movement and some of the, some of the examples in the real world and uh, some of the other topics we look at are fact checking uh, by feminist uh, online collectives and uh, online petitions and how feminism has leveraged these petitions for uh, furthering the movement and bringing um, benefit to women and then we uh, needless to mention move on to social media handles and how they are leveraged uh, for the benefit of uh, women and uh, this uh, the next part is data bias against women i think uh, not many of us are aware about this but as data points and as uh, important data points women are underrepresented in various domains and that is a problem and uh, data scientists uh, are making efforts to ensure that uh, the achievements and uh, other aspects of women uh, get collected as solid data uh, there's a book and that will also be mentioned inside the video and uh, last we'll be moving on to the uh, effects of the feminist movement and how to take part in it uh, if you're interested and uh, the conclusion and a little bit of motivation also for those who are interested to participate in the feminist movement so babi sir i think that will be all and uh, uh, the video is a two part presentation so babi sir thank you
and now we have a part two of the uh, same video. Uh, so the next part of my presentation will be on animals affected by climate change. So uh, moving on, we have the first uh, data on the panda. So the panda, as you know, is inseparable from bamboo and uh, recent changes in global temperature has uh, created a problem for uh, our panda friends. And they have a difficulty in coping up uh, with the shortage of um, uh, habitat, their natural habitat, that is bamboo. So that is how panda is affected. And uh, the next one is, um, will be going to the penguins. So how are penguins affected? Penguins are uh, glacial, uh, they live in ice regions and uh, in the Arctic, uh, region, Antarctic regions especially. And there are these certain, uh, the things that they eat called krill. So because of the melting of ice, that krill population has been affected and uh, the shortage of krill is affecting the penguin population also. As we know, every animal is dependent on uh, other life forms for their survival. So when one is affected, automatically uh, all the dependent life forms are also impacted. And uh, uh, the polar bear, uh, a similar scenario, but uh, something different that I've read yesterday is that polar bear mothers are having a very difficult time training their young to actually uh, to uh, learn survival skills because there are these areas where polar bear mothers uh, uh, are trained uh, are tra uh, training their children uh, to hunt and uh, other basic uh, life uh, activities of polar bears but those areas are rapidly disappearing and uh, there was thin ice and that thin ice is gone so the children will be very difficult for them to uh, hunt and learn those skills especially so it's becoming very difficult for them and the next animal we have is the elephant the asian elephant specifically and um, drying up of fresh water sources has created a lot of difficulty for them Invasive plants that are killing their uh, natural habitat and uh, their natural food sources. That's also creating a lot of difficulty because, of, especially because of uh, climate change, it's becoming very difficult for them since they require a lot of water. It, it will be uh, magnified. The effect on their life and survival will be magnified. Moving on, we have the green turtle. So one very peculiar thing about the green turtle is that uh, their their offspring. Uh, their sex of their offspring, it depends on the external temperature. So males and uh, 
if it's higher temperature um there are more females being born and uh, if it's lower temperature it's more males being born so that cycle of life uh, is affected and uh, there will be a disproportionate number of females because warmer areas create females that will be a big problem uh, in the future for the green turtle skewed ratios are not recommended according to scientists and uh, the next animal that we focus on is the cheetah so the cheetah uh, because of the increased um, temp- global temperature the males are having uh, according to the guardian the males are uh, experiencing lower levels of testosterone affect- affecting their ability to reproduce uh, and thus uh, generations uh, and and they also have other challenges not uh, directly related to global warming so this adds to the strain of their population and maybe uh, it will be very difficult for them to continue on as a species so uh, these uh, are directly addressing the sdg numbers 13 15 and 14 uh, that deals with climate action and uh, various life forms on water and uh, i mean uh, above below water and uh, on land so uh, i think uh, we can use a lot of uh, media resources like uh, videos or instagram pages to spread information about things that matter uh, especially and uh, i would like to also thank cns for the wonderful learning opportunity uh, that uh, they have given us uh, so i'd like to conclude my presentation with that thank you all my friends for listening uh, thank you bobby sir and so uh, thank you very much jeevan for focusing on very important issues and achieving gender equality is key to achieving sdgs and agenda 2030 and what we actually need and what i always root for is a feminist fossil fuel free future the five f's and feminism is not about matriarchy it is about solidarity okay thanks to all our speakers and before we move on to the open q and a session i would request our distinguished special guests to say a few inspiring words and a take home message for all of us i first hand over the mic to ashok ji who is a widely acclaimed award winning journalist from durban south africa and was a senior producer with south african broadcasting corporation for 30 long years he was awarded the health justice award by south africa's gandhi development trust led by mahatma gandhi's granddaughter ila gandhi who has also featured in one of our talks and he is an integral part of our cns family and we have always run to him for help whenever in need so over to you ashok ji thank you madam ji thank you very much and warm greetings to each member each student and uh, i would like to say congratulations to you guys great presentation by the young students you spoke your hearts out obviously it has become a virtual reality today in the 21st century since covid has taken the world by storm obviously you are the future leaders of india today and you seem to be speaking your hearts out regarding the 2030 sustainable development goals well i will focus on the 25 years of south africa's fledgling democracy and the media the words quote i have fought against white domination and i have fought against black domination i have cherished the idea of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities the words were uttered and quoted by nelson roy schlachla mandela february 11th 1990 this being the poignant moment in south africa's history when nelson mandela walked a free man after serving 27 years in prison in the struggle for freedom and democracy and democracy the world waited in bated breath when mandela delivered the famous speech in cape town that took the world by storm today the west african and his profound journalists from print media television and radio played a pivotal and a crucial role since the dawn of democracy in 
Mandela negotiated with former South African President F.W.D. Clark for a peaceful transition to freedom. Later, Mandela was sworn in as South Africa's first black president, ending decades of the struggle against the apartheid regime. My strand of memory takes me back almost 55 years ago when we were affected by the notorious Group Areas Act. Many people of Indian descent lived at an area called Magazine Barracks that was established in around the year 1880. The picturesque Durban Hindu temple, popularly known as the Samsi Road Temple, brought a symbol of hope during the dark ages. It was a pillar of strength in serving as a religious place of worship. My mother, the Sodia Ramsarup, who could not read or write, but was fluent in the vernacular and Isazulu, was steeped in the culture and tradition. The historic Samsuro Temple stands tall as it overlooks the Durban Magistrates Court, which was once magazine barracks, a residential area situated about three kilometers from the Indian Ocean. Hundreds of families were forced to vacate the homes in what has been described as mass removals. The apartheid storm had begun to target the area. Sadly, all the families were herded into dirt lorry trucks into the burgeoning residential Chatsworth, south of Durban. We were all devastated by this displacement under the draconian forced removals imposed. While Mandela was the chief champion, always speaking out on the important role in the country's struggle for democracy. At the International Press Conference, uh, Institute Conference in 2013, Mandela was described as a towering icon of the global movement for equality and an eloquent defender of press freedom. Mandela said, only a free press can be the vigilant watchdog of the public interest against the temptation on the part of those who wield it to abuse that power. I was fortunate to meet Mandela at Durban's exhibition center in 1990. That was a meeting of a lifetime. I was introduced to, to Mandela by a former minister. I was amazed at his memory. He had already known about my work on radio as I joined SABC in 1984. Prior to radio, that I worked for the Sunday Times in the early days, almost for 12 years. I will not forget the words uttered. I know about your work, keep it up, Mandela commented. I was fortunate to meet Mandela in 1994 when he visited uh, a train disaster site that claimed dozens of lives uh, near Pine Town, outside the port city of Durban. I managed to secure an exclusive interview as we walked in the railway, railway track at the spot where the train derailed. I retired from the SABC in 2016 after 32 years of dedicated service, bringing news, views, and interviews on radio, an important source of mass communication on a current affairs program called Newsbreak on Lotus FM. Well, as you know, current affairs is a second phased journalism. Radio news stood the test of time in informing, educating, and becoming a credible news outlet to the nation. The advent of democracy at the end of provision, harassment, beating, torture, and jailing of reporters who stood the ground and spoke out eloquently against apartheid and Nazi style operation and who defended human rights to tell South Africa and the world about the atrocities committed by the apartheid government. During my early stint on the field, I covered the story of six freedom fighters. Uh, those were from the United Democratic Front, President Archie Gumere, Mewa Ramgovan, Billy Nair, George Supersad, MJ Naidu, and Paul David, who took refuge in the British consulate in Durban in September 1984. The activists had asked the British government to meditate on their behalf. 
I was fortunate to break the story in an exclusive after speaking to Paul David from another building as to what time the activist were leaving or he was leaving the consulate. He secretly gesticulated to me this, despite the apartheid police officers were all over. Many journalists risked their lives in the reportage of news and other events of general events for newspapers, television, and radio. In 2020, the climatic conditions have changed since the outbreak of the novel coronavirus 19 pandemic that started in China and has since throughout the world. Journalists of today have a new mandate to accurately report and present current data as the devastating effects of the virus gradually spreads around the globe, including South Africa. There is uncertainty both locally and across borders and genders who are regarded eyes and ears of the world are reflecting on the unpredictability of the virus. Certainly the concerns are whether or not there will be a cure or treatment, what possible strains are to follow and how long is this pandemic expected to last. The print media and the electronic media have been successful in implementing change in people's habits, beliefs, and attitudes. Since the coronavirus, people have been updated of various crimes, gender-based violence, government policies, and changes in the process during lockdown protocols. A number of news artists are hitting the ground via social media, among them fake news. Speaking to the nation on the further easing of certain restrictions, the opening of cinemas and the hairdressing salons on level three of the lockdown, our president Cyril Ramaphosa made a clarion call to the nation to stand together against gender-based violence during the pandemic. Ramaphosa told the nation that it was another pandemic facing the country. The urban residents and members of the community police forum joined in a protest march, creating an awareness of gender-based violence following disturbing pictures on social media. In one such case, a young woman was allegedly beaten up by a boyfriend and left for dead that sparked an outrage in near Durban a week ago. Since the resumption in the sale of alcohol at the beginning of June, Ramaphosa told the nation that 21 women and children had been killed. The World Health Organization concurred that there had been an increase in cases of gender-based violence around the world as the fight against the coronavirus pandemic continues. News is the vital communication of important information on current in events, which is presented via the print, broadcast, and digital media to the general public. As a result, it is re affecting the media industry. The age of digital media is to a large degree dramatically changing the world in the field of print and broadcast journalism. The social media innovation, online media, Twitter and Facebook news are to a large degree wreaking havoc and impacting on the economic and sustainability of the established newspapers in the country. In my opinion, Radiocracy, which Durban academic Robin Sula advocated strongly a few years ago, is a key word in transforming the new structure and encourage, encouraging young journalists to follow suit as it is the lifeblood of journalism. And it is associated with providing local news at the doorstep of every home. This occurs well in terms of where local news is concerned in changing media landscape. The development of the fourth industrial revolution is a digital era traditional local news outlet were facing strong competition from social media, blogs, Twitter, Facebook, and online, online news ventures. Why local news matters in the 21st century? A number of democracies are facing an uphill battle. 
Journalists must be in the forefront of the scene and must have their ears tuned to the ground. Local reporters close to the communities have easy access to news developments and local issues. Journalism is referred to as the first draft of history involving local news and reporters have an advantage of reporting credible local news because of trusted news sources. The COVID-19 pandemic has grossly impacted on the people around the world in many countries. Older folks are reported to have died. Obviously, there are challenging times. Latest breaking news, an elderly woman who lives with her husband was diagnosed with the symptoms of the, various, of the virus at an old age home in Durban. An official confirmed in a statement a 60-year-old woman was taken to a hospital after it was established that she had a high temperature and experienced body pains. She and her husband are under quarantine, said the statement. Although all age groups are at risk of contracting the COVID-19 virus, older people face significant risk of developing severe illness if they contract the disease due to psychological changes that come with aging and potential underlying health conditions. Now news outlets throughout the country have raised concerns, concern calling for the economy to be reopened. Citizens and business leaders echo the call as schools reopened last week. Several schools were forced to shut down as some educators and people were diagnosed with COVID-19 virus. Flattening the curve is the ultimate goal to opening up the economy. The South African media faces serious financial challenges as some have no income during the lockdown period. And according to a latest report, the SABC was planning to retrench hundreds of employees to cut costs and create modern, agile, and future-focused broadcaster. The aim of the plan was to reduce the SABC's salary bill by 700,000 million rand in a bid to create a sustainable state broadcaster. As COVID-19 has wreaked havoc throughout the world, South Africa's fledgling democracy has challenges to face. During my exchange program in India, one of the pointers was development journalism, which I was fortunate to be studying at the IMC in New Delhi. Today, the leaders can learn from the journalists that continuously write about the conditions in developing states and how to improve them. While the lockdown moves to another level, COVID-19 exposes the extent of poverty worldwide. Development journalism brings to light the issues that are overlooked on by certain media houses. Investigative journalists have a task to uncover the stories and highlight the nature of poverty. In 1987, I covered the floods that devastated parts of Durban and other areas in, in our province, KwaZulu Natal. This caused extensive damage to property, leaving thousands of people homeless, and farmers suffered immensely as a result of the destruction. South African Online recorded one of the bravery, bravery stories that occurred on the 28th of October, 1917, when more than 400 market gardeners from the former tin town at Springfield in Durban drowned when the banks of the Amgani River burst after heavy rains. At the local newspaper reported, reported extensively of the tragedy. Mari Motupadavatan played a heroic role in the rescue of civilians. However, radio did not bring the breaking news as it happened to the people at the time. Former freedom fighter and academic Priti Raj Ramkisum Dulay penned in his book entitled Salt Water Runs in My Veins about the drowning of his family, including his grandfather in the Amzinkulu River flooding in 1959. Dulay and his father later found the bodies. 
he pointed that while the ham radio communication was limited, links to the rest of South Africa were cut off for two weeks. In 1933, South African-based non-governmental organization, Gift of the Givers, sent locally manufactured mobile hospital to war-torn Bosnia. The state-of-the-art hospital provided an intensive care unit, an X-ray unit, orthopedic and outpatients unit. This was a local, locally manufactured product for the international market as well. Newsbreak provided local, national, and international news. As a result, was the country's leading news outlet, outlet in the country. On the international, on the international news, I covered the promotion of peace talks between nuclear rivals India and Pakistan, bringing on the spot news as being locals. The news was important to thousands of South Africans. Indians as their forebears landed on the shores of Durban to work on the sugarcane plantations. I was the first South African to be honored with the Peace Award in 1987. Whilst being devoted in the fight against apartheid and working for non-violent, peaceful and just social order as a news hound, I worked tirelessly in the unification of sport, especially between the non-racial federation and professional soccer league and the National Soccer League. In some instances, it took a courageous stand in quoting banned people on the SABC. I also risked my family, job, and family covering banned leaders, including former President Dabo Becky and Praveen Gordon on radio. I will conclude. Thank you so much for inviting me on the program. Thank you, Madam G. Thank you, Bobby, for allowing me to speak. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ashok Ji, and very inspiring to hear so many unknown, inspiring experiences of your career and life. I was not aware of them and really, really, very, very inspiring. And of course, all that good work which you have done and you continue to do so. Uh, I wanted uh, Firdos Siddiqui to say a few words, but perhaps she's again facing some internet problem and she had to log out. She's trying to log in again. If we get her again online, I would invite her. And uh, meanwhile, we will have the open session now. Uh, participants, please keep on type your questions in the chat box uh, or raise your virtual hand if you wish to speak. Uh, we already have a few questions uh, here. So I'm, there is a question from Rahul Tripathi for the first group, that is uh, Mihir, Sunil, and Suraj. And uh, uh, he asked, can you please elaborate on the change in the approach towards the sustainable development goals in the coming years due to COVID-19 pandemic? What could be the change in approach? Any one of that group can answer. Mehir, Sunil, Suraj. Are you there? Uh, the next question is for the, the second group. That is uh, Anjali, B. Sai, Sushma, Par, Pranab, Priya, and Sri Shanta. That technology application to medicine is important. Thanks for a wonderful presentation. But how do we ensure that technology rich medical applications become accessible to all and, not, and do not remain the domain of a few? Do you think public health systems can help there? Yes. <clears throat> Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are very audible, yes. So according to Mr. Uh, Amit Khare, what he said that is, is that uh, in fact, the first institutions which were uh, which were adopting this technology were was uh, government institutions. So it, it, it might be in the next uh, four or five years, uh, a, a lot uh, almost all of the government hospitals in at least not, not North India would adopt this and we will so soon see 
uh, this being adopted by almost all all hospitals so as far as adoption is concerned it's going to be pretty good and uh, when you say accessibility uh, could, could you repeat the question regarding accessibility yeah. how does how do they become accessible to all and just uh, do not uh, remain in the domain of perhaps the rich few or the or the elite ah uh, so i think it's pretty accessible to every, everyone because it's it's a mobile app it's not something that you have to buy separately it's, it's you can download it from the play store so i think everyone with a mobile phone can access it and secondly they said that it requires no subscription so you don't have to pay extra money for that as well so any anyone with a mobile phone like that's the only prerequisite you need to have hence it's pretty accessible i think okay okay thank you uh we have a question for anjali roy and anurag dattan and group uh, uh, who spoke on msmes that very significant issue as small scale and medium scale industries are engaged into economy uh, very important challenges confronting this small uh, uh, the small scale small and middle scale industries you have enlisted but it is also the big mnc's that kill or weaken the small and middle scale industries uh so what are your insights on this for example look how the few chains dominate grocery store markets in southeast asia and they are decimating the small grocery shops so would you like to say something on that anjali anurag any one of you if you are there yes just unmute yourself and speak anjali roy or any one of the group can answer the question okay i i move on to the next question which is uh, for sartaj singh uh, a great point on bricks Uh, population is forty-two percent globally, but GDP contribution twenty-two percent. How can we have fairer and more equitable distribution of the wealth and a more equitable world, Sartaj? Uh, yeah. So, uh, particularly with regard to BRICS, as I mentioned. Uh, so uh, here again, uh, there is uh, India is one of the two top countries out of BRICS in terms of economy. If you look at is the nominal gdps now uh, perhaps one of the ideas could again be to have economic reforms at large scales in countries which are uh, highly uh, which are highly unleveraged for example the brics one so there needs to be economic reforms and uh, especially in this era of covid in if we need to minimize that gap between uh, the between the uh, minimize the gap between the countries so it's really important in my opinion if as uh, if you would have heard to abhijit banerjee also it's important to provide money in the hands of the people rather than doing just tax reforms because in a situation like this and not only this specific pandemic situation people will just sit on the tax reforms if if you'll provide them tax cuts it it will just lead to having them sit on them and not investing because uh, many most like the brics countries are the developing ones so they are not developed so investment is not really a thing with high which is highly uh, prevalent so it's important to provide direct monetary benefits and putting hands in the uh, hands in uh, money in the hands of people and maybe the subsidies could be reduced in order to pay for those direct as some initiatives had been done like uh, uh, recently like 1500 per rupees per month were put in the bank accounts uh, by the government i think more of those could be done uh, these are just basic level things again it 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 needs a trust to be developed in order to again start trade on a high level and given the china uh, problems with india and the brics are facing a lot of troubles and even the post uh, in the pre corona situation uh brazil uh, was not growing it was rather uh, degrading like the uh, their economy was shrinking already so 
uh, those countries have had a huge impact uh, de- uh, devastating impact because of covid but i think economic reforms are the way ahead for those developing countries and obviously un and their advisories can play a huge role in this okay uh, uh, thank you sartaj and uh, we are running short of time uh, just one last question for g1 uh, a very relevant and powerful presentation gender justice is so central jeevan and linking human development with environment and other life forms and planet is also important the my question is do you see governments thinking like you in such a wholesome manner or do you see more vertical programs or isolated approaches yeah uh, th- thank you very much for the question so i think uh, there are a lot of non government uh, bodies that are doing research uh, into both of these aspects there are also individuals and professors in their capacities who are doing a lot of research into gender justice you can see it in the countries uh, western countries like uh, perhaps the united states and um, uh, east uh, western europe also that there is a prevalence of research that is aimed at bringing about gender justice if these uh, individuals in their uh, academic institutions like uh, high uh, the colleges of higher education uh, they can get together and form collectives and then uh, press uh, the governments of their respective countries to take up initiatives such that uh, uh, gender equality and uh, also uh, conservation of animals all of these if if they can provide the government with proper data and proper measures which they can because they are already um, individuals with uh, uh, access to resources uh, and uh, media, media uh, and also uh, technology uh, they'll be aware of all of that so that they can put it into a concise form and uh, present white papers to governments and also uh, start alternate movements uh, i think there are several green parties that are emerging in western countries also um, uh, so and uh, one limitation as uh, you mentioned madam is that most of this seems to be centered around the western sphere of the world which is um, uh disappointing uh, and also at the same time there is an opportunity there uh, and that opportunity is that people in the developing world should also take uh, the responsibility on their hands and uh, try to uh, imp- implement these measures learn more about these and of course uh, push the governments for uh, a more inclusive growth model as you mentioned ma'am thank you thank you we have already overshot the time so i think with this we come to the end of today's session and my sincere thanks to our two very special guests also to our speakers and to the audience for being with us today excellent presentations by our future managers uh, we meet again tomorrow at the same time uh, and tomorrow's session will be moderated by sartaj singh so bye till then and stay safe thank, thank you madam ji thank you ma'am thank you very much Thank you ma'am. Thank you.